Welcome to the Habitat Podcast, the podcast for wildlife habitat management, hunting strategy, and land stewardship. And now, your host, Jared Van Hees. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the Habitat Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Van Hees, and we are here to become better habitat managers. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in once again. We have another great episode for you here today. We have Patrick McFadden. Pat is a big-time member over at NWTF, or the National Wild Turkey Federation. He is also an employee of Base Camp Country Real Estate. We've had a few other guys on, and just a great habitat resource Pat is. And you're going to find that out here in this episode. We cover the National Wild Turkey Federation, what they're all about, what they do, how big they are, and the cool things they do for the habitat and the wild turkey uh, over over this country. They're a huge organization. We talk about that, then we get into turkey habitat specifically. We talk about what types of habitat turkeys need and how that can benefit other wildlife like deer, small game, etc. Uh, we talk about roosting areas, bugging and feeding fields, uh, dusting areas, soft edges, and early successional forests. All these types of habitat and how turkeys can use them to survive and, and thrive on. So there's a lot of good stuff in this episode, guys. A lot of stuff regarding turkey habitat and how it relates to hunting and also other types of wildlife habitat. I would like to thank Packer Max Colter Packers for their uh, partnership with the Habitat Podcast. They are, were our very first partner. We're still going strong with Lincoln and his high-quality cult of Packers over there. They just came out with a new wheel kit this year where you can throw it on the edges of your pack or two wheels and flip that thing over and be able to, to drive that down your trail or your road and not have to cult the pack your whole way there. It's a pretty cool accessory that Lincoln has over at PackerMax.com. And be sure to check that out. I'm going to be using my cult of Packer here to roll in a few food plots from the existing rye that's there. I broadcasted a bunch of rye into these food plots uh, last fall. And now I'm going to go in there. Right when it's maturing, I'm going to roll it over with Cult of Packer a bunch of times and kind of act like a, like a roller crimper type thing, but just simply rolling it and terminating that rye. And then um, my buddy Al even said you could go through after that and mow down any existing rye that might be standing too. So that's kind of a way that I'm going to try it again this year and see what happens. But be sure to mention the Habitat Podcast if you call Lincoln for a Cult of Packer because we get $25 off any Cult of Packer just by mentioning that you listen to this podcast. So be sure to check that out. And you know he's got a brand new website over there at PackerMax.com and get yourself a Cult of Packer for uh, this 2020 food plot season. I would also like to thank Nick Nation and the Habitat Hook. Now a lot of my TSI work and hinge cutting and tree felling and flush cutting is all done in the winter time, early spring, but I'm also going to get out there and do some edge feathering here this summer into my food plots, and that habitat hook would be a great way to direct your trees where you want them to fall. Um, it's kind of a safety feature. You can push and pull on the tree, get it to go where you want it, and uh, edge feathering the edge of a food plot, as we've talked about many times, helps break up that hard edge along between the food plot and the woods or the food plot and the cover. So check out these hooks over at the Habitat Hook on Facebook or HabitatHook.com. You can also get them at NationsCreations.net. And be sure to tell them the Habitat Podcast sent you guys. It's a great product and uh, probably my favorite TSI tool other than my chainsaw. Now for anybody who's new to the podcast, you can find all of our information and content at HabitatPodcast.com. We have uh, a ton of YouTube videos going up here in 2020 i think we're approaching 100 videos now so be sure to check the habitat podcast out on youtube please subscribe if you can and then uh you know if you don't mind leave us a good review i know you can leave reviews on facebook on our page you can leave them on itunes you can leave them on spotify matter of fact we got a couple new ones this week on itunes so i'm going to be sending these guys some some free decals here andy r from pennsylvania says just what i was looking for I just bought 20 acres, and I'm looking to learn everything I can about making this the best acres to hunt on. I know it's a small parcel, and this podcast is helping me decide what strategy will work best. Great guests, great tips, and lots of different perspectives. Thank you, Andy. 
uh, you hit the nail on the head there. We definitely try to get a lot of great perspectives and, and the best guests we can uh, to relate to us regular guys. So thanks for that nice review there. Uh, we have another five-star review here on iTunes from Brothers Rut. When you want to learn about Habitat for Whitetails, there is no other podcast to do it as well or consistent. Very grateful for the free education. Thank you, Brothers Rut. I'm going to find you guys and get you guys some decals. And, you know, we try to be the, the best we can for the free information we're given. And, uh, you know, keep consistently delivering it to you guys. So thank you so much for those awesome reviews. I really appreciate everybody checking us out this week. Another great episode. I'd like to thank the HuntWise app, Killer Food Plots, 5-2 Outdoors, Stony Creek Realty, and Michigan Whitetail Pursuit for their support of this podcast. All right, guys, without further ado, let's get Pat McFadden on the show. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Habitat Podcast. I'm your host, Jared. We have Brian on the line, our trusty co-host, and a special guest tonight, Pat McFadden. How you doing tonight, Pat? I'm doing real good. How are you guys getting along? Good. Doing great. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a beautiful day here. How about down by you? Oh, yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. Bluebird skies. It got a little warm today. It was up in the 90s, but uh, a little warm for this time of the year. But we'll take it. It's blowing. All right, we need the heat for the crops, so it's all good. Are you guys all planted down there? Uh, for the most part, um, everything's in. Uh, we had some early flooding. Some Some of the river bottom guys got in early, and they flooded out some spots, but They'll just go back in there and drill some beans, you know, and uh, even in the cornfield. So, yeah, everything's good so far. Awesome, awesome. Good to hear. Yeah, we're uh, – I think we were low 80s here today, Bluebird Sky. Just uh, summer – summer is here. I think we skipped uh, skipped a little bit of spring. We had pretty late winter. We had some – a lot of rain. Now we're into summer. So, kind of moved fast. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Pat, we normally like to start this out with hearing about who our guests are, you know, where you're from. Tell us about maybe a little bit how you grew up or just kind of, I always like to say, paint us a picture of, of who Pat McFadden is. This is, uh, you know, I grew up in Indiana, uh, north central Indiana, Tippecanoe County. And uh, for those of you that don't know a whole lot about Indiana, that's where Purdue University is. And uh, so I grew up on a rural on a farm and like I said in rural Tippecanoe County we raised corn soybeans and some wheat um, we had livestock we had cattle hogs chickens so uh, you know we did our own butchering growing up as today I still do some of that to this day we butcher hogs and every now and then we throw in we butcher a few chickens we butcher our own deer so that's some lifelong things that I learned why we why I was growing up in the in the farm community um, as I got older um, you know, things just kept going. I, of course, wanted to farm like every other boy that grew up on a farm, just wasn't enough farm ground to, to support everybody. My dad, he worked in town as a uh, union uh, welder, pipe fitter welder, and uh, he was a welder for 42 years. He's been retired for a good while. So um, I followed his footsteps, and I became a, a union plumber, pipe fitter, welder as well. And uh, I'm a 32-year member of our local here in our in our state, one of the locals. And uh, as of right now, um, I work at Purdue University as a senior construction estimator. I've been at Purdue University for uh, a little over 10 years doing that job. Um, I've got a beautiful wife that I've been married to for 27 years. We've got two children. Um, TJ is our oldest one. He's 25. And then I've got a daughter that's 23, and she's uh, getting ready to get married here in just about uh, two weeks, um, June the 13th. So things are moving pretty fast around here for us on that aspect of things. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of a nutshell on, on, on my family and, and a little bit of my background, um, how I got a little bit involved in some of the things I got involved in. I always loved to th see things grow. I was always that, that type of person that would, would go out and look at the corn every night and see how much it grew. And, you know, so that stuff always intrigued me how it was going and, and why I never got into the horticulture field. I'll never know, you know, that kind of thing, but, um, <laughs> that's what I just, yeah. I just love to see that, that kind of stuff happen, you know? So, um, that was, that's always kind of been in my blood. And one other thing that really kind of drove me to what we're going to talk about here in a little bit is conservation. And I really didn't, um, 
I realize it uh, at, at a young age, I guess, but something that really sticks into my mind. Um, we did a lot of coon hunting when I was a kid and there wasn't a whole lot of deer around. You know, my, my dad, he would go down to Hoosier national forest and hunt deer. And we never, you know, I can remember seeing the first deer here in our, around us, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty neat stuff. But anyway, um, when we coon hunted a lot and my grandpa, um, when he was alive, he had some friends down in Kentucky and they'd come up and hunt. And I remember treeing some coons and, you know, in a, in a tree. And I don't remember the exact story. I, my dad tells me, you know, he, he corrects me sometimes, but the, um, the old boy that was up here from Kentucky, he wanted that we treat three coons and my grandpa shot one coon out and he leased up the dogs and said, let's go or hunt another one. And his buddy says, well, he says, you know, he says, we ought to, we've got three of them treated. Let's kill all three of them. You know, we're, we're here. And my grandpa says, you know, we're not going to kill all three of them. Cause I got to, I got to hunt here again. So that was kind of my first, first taste of conservation, you know, and that's stuck with me for, you know, over 50 years on how that, how that all works. And, you know, that, that's something that I always tell that story when I'm doing habitat seminars or what I'm doing different things, you know, that's just something that has really stuck in my crawl on, on how you need to save things for your future generations or even for tomorrow, you know, and that sort of thing. So that's really, um, how well some of the things we're going to talk about that's a little bit of background i got off stage there a little bit on what we're talking about but um <laughs> as to okay. give you a little background on a little background on you know some of my beliefs i guess on how i grew up but you know no i think uh, i think that's a great background i think a lot of people need to to think more like that sometimes i mean i've been guilty of that in the past you know whether you're catching your limit of fish or or whatever it could be um it's fun to keep going when you're when you're just you're in them you know but you always want there to be more when you come back and how old were you when that when that went down with your grandpa there do you think uh you know, you know i was probably seven or eight years old somewhere in that range you know you so yeah, that's been a you know yeah that's a, well you know that kind of stuff that sinks in pretty deep you know yes sir and just yeah, just yeah just something like that you know the I can't, sometimes I can't remember my birthday, but I can remember things like that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I hear you. I hear you. So you've always growing up in, uh, in Indiana. Have you lived in Indiana your whole life? You still live there? I have. Yep. I actually live in, uh, I actually end up buying the farm that my, that my mom was raised in. So wow. yep, I've, uh, the house that my mom and dad, mom and dad built new one of the house that in 1969, I can see it right up the road. And, uh, so yeah, I've lived in this same area, got family everywhere. My uncle still farm. And, uh, so everybody's close and, uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty tight knit little community around here, but it's like every place else in the country town's catching us, you know, it's moving out closer and closer all the time. So yeah, we'll see how all that plays out at some point, but. Okay. Okay. And, uh, how big of an area do you and your family kind of manage in, in Indiana there? I mean, are you guys talking like, hundred acres or are you a lot bigger? Or, I mean, I don't um, have to well, like want, my, well, no, no, that's fine. My uncle's farm about 1200 acres. They're down a little bit. They're getting up in their late seventies. So they're kind of backing off a little bit. At one time they were farming about 2,500 acres, which, which isn't a lot, but our, our immediate family, my dad and I, we've got, uh, you know, right at about 60 acres of tillable ground that we just cash rent anymore. Um, he had sold, he sold the old farm place, the old home farm and he bought, um, another farm and moved to that particular farm. But anyway, um, and then we have another 75 acres in the next County over towards Illinois. It's a Warren County, Indiana, which backs up uh, right to Illinois. So we have a recreational property over there that we manage just for hunting period. Oh, That's wow. all we do on that. Yeah. For, so we've got 75 acres there that we've probably got about, well, we've got almost 13 acres of food plots on the place. And, and, uh, so yeah, that's something that we manage for, for our deer and our turkey and you know squirrel hunting and it's got a couple of creeks on it and so yeah it's a pretty nice little slice of heaven that we've got so and how far is that from where you're at now is it pretty close to home or is it a little bit of a trip uh yeah it's about it's about 20 25 minutes so oh, it's, not, it's not far at all oh. no 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 pretty close yeah we've owned it oh i don't know going on let's see i think we bought it in 2013 um, and then, uh, we're just now getting around. It was a, it was an old rundown farmstead, you know, and, um, so we did a lot of work, you know, but people, I don't think people appreciate it as much as we do because of what it was when we bought it and what it is now, you know, it's, it's, a, you know, if you were to show up there the first time, you know, now and look at it and not understand what it was before, 
uh, you know, you, you can't get the true appreciation for it's like anybody's farm, you know, that sure. does a lot of work and does a lot of things, but you know, we look back on it and then, and this year uh, there's an old hay barn on there right now that we've utilized and just to store some equipment in and so on and so forth. But uh, we're getting ready to here just not too long. We're going to build us a new pole barn down there and not a great big pole barn, but we're going to put a cabin in the end of it so we can have a little weekend get away and not have to take the, you know, drag the camper down there and, and, you know, make a, we just throw a bag of groceries in the, in the truck and a, and a bed roll and we're good for the night, you know, kind of thing. So. It's funny. That's it's our funny next, you say that's that. Our next step. No, it's, that's awesome. And even though it might be only 30 minutes, uh, I just dropped my camper off on my property today for the first time. So it's kind of, uh, I'm kind of in that same boat as you is it'd be nice to have just a spot to kick back and not have to drive home late or get up too early for once. You know, it's, it's pretty nice. I'm excited. Sure. Yeah. And then, uh, and that farm actually is, if, um, when I go to work, it's only like 18 minutes to work from work oh, nice. from the farm. So, yeah, so I can, uh, you know, if it happens to be on a Sunday night, I can still make it to work on Monday and, you know, and not uh, have to worry about coming all the way home or what have you. So it's pretty nice. Pretty nice. Yeah, that's a nice setup, Pat. I'm lucky to have a cabin on my 40 up in northeast Ohio that I built uh, probably a year or two after I bought the place. So that, but I'm a little bit further. I'm like an hour and a half from my house. So it, it makes a huge difference after you're working there till. 9 30 at night in the summertime yeah absolutely yeah just kicking back on the porch and having a cold drink and you know either building a fire or not or just you know just being able to relax for a little bit and kind of look back on the work that you've done for the day and not have to worry about loading up and coming home and tractors and trailers and everything else you know it's it, it can become a it can become a job <laughs> if you let no it doubt. You know? no for doubt for sure yeah so let's dive into the NWTF. What What is this organization and uh, what do you focus on for listeners that maybe aren't too familiar with it? Well, the NWTF is the National Wild Turkey Federation, and it was founded in 1973 by Tom Rogers and I guess some of his buddies in the garage, you know, when it kind of gets down to that part. But it's a private, nonprofit uh, conservation and education organization. And the mission is dedicated to conserving wild turkey and preserving our hunting heritage is what the NWTF is all about. That's the main thing that the NWTF stands for. Of course, when you, when you dwell into that, you know, it is one of the best. Oh, well, I don't know if it's, I won't, I'll go out on a limb here and say it is the best conservation um, effort in the United States. As far as I'm concerned, you know, for right. what they do, nice. uh, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll put the plug in for them. You know, we've got over, yeah. you know, 250,000, 250,000 dedicated volunteers, you know, and staff and, and, you know, and committed partners that help us. And we had, you know, so many su- successes in our advance and our mission, you know, for the things that we do. It is, it is so awesome that, you know, everybody thinks that the, that the NWTF is just a good old boy turkey hunting club, you know, and that's the farthest thing from the truth that there is, you know, that we all love to shoot turkeys. Don't get me wrong. But there is so much stuff that happens um, within the NWTF, you know, with our with the conservation, you know, that we support so much scientific wildlife management on on public, private, and corporate lands. Um, you know, we have technical committees that that consist of wild turkey biologists from state and and even Canadian, uh, you know, Canadian areas wildlife agencies who make recommendations on research and management and restoration and educational programs. I mean, it's it, the list goes on and on and on, you know, for the good things that we do that, that the, the average person, I don't know that that's outside looking in, you know, and think, well, I don't need to be a member of the NWTF because there's turkeys all around me. You know, well, the reason that there's turkeys all around you uh, is because of the NWTF. And, you know, without the membership and, the, you know, your $35 membership that, that people pay or the, the, the higher level giving memberships that happen and the people that don't donate money to allow for the for everything to happen for us to have wild turkeys in 49 out of the 50 states is, is just it's just mind boggling when you get right down to it. You know, um, you know, within the, since the inception of the NWTF, you know, we spent over four hundred million dollars upholding these hunting traditions and conserving more than 17 million acres of wildlife habitat. Wow. You know, think about wow. that, you know, that, I mean, that's, impressive. that's an impressive number, you know, it, it's, it's pretty cool, you know, and sure even is. since two, even since 2012, um, we had a, 
initiative called Save the Habitat and Save the Hunt. It was a 10-year initiative, like I said, starting in 2012. And it was to, and it was a pretty lofty goal, and it was to conserve or enhance 4 million acres of critical wildlife habitat and to recruit 1.5 million hunters and open access to 500,000 additional acres just for hunting. You know, so you stop and think about that. You know, when, when they come up with this model of how we're going to do this, you know, how are we going to do this? And everybody come together, and with the NWTF, the volunteers, like I said, the you know the volunteers and the people they put their they put their work boots on, they did it, you know. And then since and now in 2019, just a seven year total, we've we've conserved three million five hundred eighty three thousand acres, you know, in seven years, and we've recruited over one point five million hunters. So we've already met that goal. And we've opened up 620, over 626,000 acres for hunting, open access to hunting. So just in seven short years out of that 10-year initiative, we've blown that out of the water, you know. Oh, and that yeah. is just so cool. That is so it's cool to be a part of an organization that just that, that puts their boots, you know, they put their money where their mouth is. I guess I could put it that way. You know, I think it's sure. and, and for me to be a part of that is just, you know, at the level that I'm a part of it, it is just, it is just awesome, you know. And, sure. you know, and, and we, when we get right down to it, you know, we talk about all the conservation projects and stuff. And, you know, a lot of the, the, the normal membership, they don't get to see, um, you know, some of the projects that go on. You know, if you go to one of your um, fish and wildlife areas, you'll see a sign or something that may say, you know, conservation project and have the NWTF sign on it. And like I said, most people don't even know what the NWTF is, you know, but we don't only just do conservation. We do outreach programs, you know, that the NWTF family is what I like to call it, the family flock. You know, we've helped thousands of kids, thousands of women, people with disabilities to learn outdoor skills. You know, it's maybe not so much just about the hunting, but how to, you know, shooting sports, you know, like with the 4-H and things like that. You know, we have so many programs that help people learn what to do, you know, or get them excited about it. You know, we have, you know, you know, even like the, the women in the outdoors, you know, that's a dedicated outdoor education for women, you know, and that's what we will kind of do locally is we have what they call it. We women in the outdoors. And what that is, is the whole event for the day, you know, we'll do a dove hunt or we'll do a put and take pheasant hunt, or we'll do a hunting one Oh one or whatever. That's the only people that attend it to learn are women. Right. So we all get together and we do that the same way with a, with a Jake's day. A, a Jake's day is juniors acquiring knowledge, ethics, and sportsmanship that's what jake stands for but it's anywhere from the program designed for for children up to age 12 and then they have an extreme jakes for 13 to 18 but they have so many programs again for those you know learn to shoot you know shoot bows and arrows and they got bb gun ranges and so much stuff just to get kids involved and you know dedicating you know we dedicate you get to teach them the principles of wildlife management and teach them the ethics of hunting you know and that just how to be ethical and responsible and you know, the safe traditions that we all like to have. And even when you're hiking and fishing, you know, if you're, if you're out someplace, you know, you, you, you pick up the trash or you see something wrong, you know, there's just so many things that, that happen, you know, throughout the NWTF, the Wheeling Sportsman, you know, that kind of speaks for itself. The Wheeling for, you think about a wheelchair, you know, it, it's providing people with disabilities, you know, the opportunity to enjoy the outdoors. You know, there's huge, huge Wido event every year up in Michigan. It's up in the UP. And, uh, you know, that guy, he just, I mean, they knock it out of the park, the state. I mean, so there's so many around the country, you know, just not in Indiana, but they're everywhere, you know, from north to south, east and west. It's just, it's just awesome, you know, to see, to be a part of that and, uh, and, and just to be able to, you know, I'm not going to say pat myself on the back, but pat everybody's back. That's an NWTF member because every dollar that's raised for the NWTF, 90 cents of that every dollar goes back into the mission, you know? That's so fantastic. you think about that, you know, Absolutely. that's, that's 90% of the money goes back into the conservation, you know, or to our, and to our mission, you know? So it, it just, it's, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's mind boggling when you really get down to it. And we have so many people that, um, that I know that, uh, that come to our, what they call a hunting heritage banquet and what a hunting hunting heritage super fun banquet basically is is that we have uh, basically a night of fellowship and fun we have um, a silent auction we have a live auction we have all kinds of games you know our local one this year you know we had 16 guns that we give away that night 
and, uh, you know, just all kinds of fun stuff, have a really good meal. And, and what happens is with all that money that's raised, and they're, they're everywhere, there's over 2,500 chapters throughout the United States, and every chapter has a hunting heritage banquet. And that money raised through that goes into a super fund, and that super fund, the money from the super fund is dispersed throughout, you know, the states so you can do your, your conservation projects and your outreach projects. That's how, what funds the conservation project. So the money that goes into the super fund comes back out of the super fund, and we pay, you know, for these conservation projects, you know, so that's just, that's just awesome that, you know, the, the average person can come, they might not even hunt, but they like the, the merchandise that we have there. They like the venue and they like coming there and having fun, you know, and they might just be a gun collector that just wants extra guns, you know, or they, they like the, the silent auction items or what have you. So it's a, uh, it's pretty, it's a pretty neat organization that, you know, I have not met anybody in the NWTF yet that doesn't, have like-minded ideas as everybody else. You know, I, I, it's just, it's just so refreshing to be able to sit down at Nashville, Tennessee at the national convention when we have 60,000 people come through the door and come to the national convention in a, a four day convention. And, you know, I sit through a lot of meetings down there with where I'm at in the NWTF right now, but when I'm out with everybody else and we sit in these big dinners and stuff and I'm sitting with, eight other people at a table, my wife and I, and they're from all over the United States and they have the same thought process as I do. It's just a little bit different because it's a little bit demographic in the state, you know, Arizona and Indiana may be a little different, but the, the, the mission's the same, you know, we got to save, we got to save all of our habitat and everything for our future generations to enjoy. You know, it's just, it's just, it's eye opening to actually be with that many people and, and, and see how it really works. No, I think it's, it's extremely eye opening. Just a lot of the facts and numbers that you just, you just dropped there. I mean, I didn't realize you guys were that, that large. Uh, holy cow. And, and the stuff that you guys do, um, before we get into what you do specifically for NWTF, how can like, how can I find out what a Michigan project might be or, or how can Brian find out or somebody in Pennsylvania you know, what, what's going on with NWTF over there, like where the habitat was improved or like a past project that was done. You guys have that listed somewhere? Yep, yep. If you go to nwtf.org, you can go on there and then you pick a, uh, your state, say Michigan or Ohio or, or Pennsylvania or Indiana or what have you, and it'll take you to, there'll be a, there'll be a tab on there that says, you know, conservation or it'll say, um, if it says conservation or if it'll say projects, I don't remember. But it'll give you the synopsis of what that state's doing. I know Michigan. Michigan has a really good website. Um, the state has their own website, and they do a fantastic job of keeping that website up to date and everything that's going on. Indiana actually shares a wildlife biologist with uh, Michigan. Ryan Boyer. He's, I mean, he's second to, to no one. I consider him a really good friend. You know, he comes down here and we hunt together. We deer hunt together. Him and his wife come down and. We all hunt and, you know, we, we get together in Michigan and do a little bit of turkey hunting and, and things. But, but without Ryan, uh, we couldn't do a lot of things we do. Um, the NWTF puts some phenomenal people in positions that they need to be in. And um, Ryan is one of those exceptional people that, I mean, he just, I mean, what, what he does for the NWTF in Michigan and Indiana is just, it's just unfathomable what he can do, you know, with the, with the money that we gain, wow. you know, and yeah, because we have, I think, you know, over the, what happens is, is, is we don't just use that money. You know, we take that money, um, you know, I'll, I'll jump forward here just to, just to touch. But in 2019, just in Indiana, we had 11 to 1 match on our work. So what that means for every dollar that we put forth, our partners that we include into these, you know, maybe Pheasants Forever and Quails Unlimited or QDMAA, you know, it, it, just you name an organization, you know, other than Rocky Mountain Elk, because we don't have any elk here in Indiana, but, you know, other organizations that, that want to jump on board and help with these because of the habitat conservation that we're doing, they want to get on board and the states put some money into it. You know, the state DNRs and the federal lands and so on and so forth. So, you know, in 2019, we invested um, almost $200,000, $200,000 towards conservation projects and we matched it. We didn't match it. Ryan's the one Ryan Boyer, you know, he's the one that goes out and works with all these partners to get it. And we were, we did 11 to one match on that money. 
last year. Wow. So that was over, you know, 2,600,000 plus worth of work that we got done for that $200,000. So, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the great thing about it. Yeah. You know, and there's other states, you know, I don't know, it was last year or two years ago. I don't remember. Don't quote me on this, but you know, we were like 16 to one just because of the projects. It all depends on the projects, you know, and, and, you know, some years we might be a little lower than that, but we we're very seldom below 10 to one on, on money, you know, so that's, and that happens in every state, you know, so you take that 400 plus million dollars that we spent earlier and you think about that and you take that, you know, 11 to one match or 10 to one match or 15 to one match on that money, you know, that's a lot of money going back into, into conservation and to our mission. You know, that's, that's the main thing. So, yeah, that's great to hear yeah. because uh, you hear a lot of negative things and how bad things are getting with hunting numbers and everything else, but to hear there's still corporations and individuals willing to reach out and help with this stuff. That's, that's excellent to hear for sure. It is, you know, it's just, it's a simple fact, you know, I've got a, we've got a car dealership here in town, you know, and he always sponsors our banquet. You know, you have different levels that you can come to the banquet and sponsor banquet, you know, and, and, uh, and he's not a huge hunter, but he likes to hunt a little bit, you know, I mean, he's not one of those guys that's, you know, diehard or what have you, but, you know, he understands the mission of the NWTF. And he wants to support it and he supports it at a high level, you know, and then he gets his buddies to come in and support it at a high level, you know, Hey, you guys need to come to this banquet. It's a lot of fun. And next thing you know, they're bringing through four people and you know, then the, you're making more money and more money. And, and the more money that you make at those banquets, the more money we get to put on the ground, you know, for every dollar, that's like great. I said, every dollar that goes out, every dollar that's going out the end of the, in the kitty, we're putting 90 cents back, you know? So that's, it's, it's pretty awesome. So, Pat, how did you get involved with the NWTF and uh, walk us through your progression with the organization? All right. Well, what I did is I was like anybody else, and I would I went to a banquet, right? And uh, the the banquet that I was at, it was a small banquet. It was probably a, oh, I don't know, maybe a 60-person banquet. And um, I noticed that they seemed to be awful shorthanded. They, you know, they, they didn't seem like they had enough people to run the games and they didn't have enough people to work in the door. And so I seen a guy that was in an NWTF shirt and I walked up to him and I said, Hey, can I help? He kind of looked at me like I had three eyeballs to be honest with you. And, and he's like, well, yeah, you want to help? I said, absolutely. What can I do? You know, he said, would you care to run a game? I said, no, I'll run a game. So I sold off a, I don't know, a turkey pole, you know, a knife pole or some sort of a game and to, to give away a gun. And then when I got done doing that, I, I helped do something else. And, as the night went on and um, the banquet ended and I stayed around and I helped clean up and I just got to talking to the, to the, the small committee of guys. There was like four or five guys that were running this whole show, you know? And I said, man, I said, what do you guys, are you the only people that are running this thing? What's going on? You know, cause I've been to some other ones throughout the state also just going around hitting some different banquets and it's like, yeah, we get by, you know, no big deal. And I was like, man, I, I need to be a part of this. I said, I really like what's going on. And, and uh, so you know, we fast forward about two years. I'm the president of the local committee, you know, of our local chapter. And <laughs> nice. then, uh, so, you know, so as I was, I've, I've always been kind of a doer in my lifetime. You know, I'm not one of those guys. I'm kind of a type A personality and I like to get things done. And so it's like any other organization that you belong to. If you, if you believe in it and you start talking to some of your friends and they come and help at a banquet and next thing you know, they want to be part of the committee. And as my, my kids got older, you know, uh, they wanted to help. And as my nephews and they got older, you know, I've got now two of my nephews, they sit on the committee with me and one of them's an officer on our local committee. And, you know, another one helped me with the, with my, uh, with some other programs that are going on. So it's kind of a family affair and the whole, and the whole deal. And, and then, um, from that, as we progressed, uh, went from a small, small banquet all the way up to, and now we're, you know, we've about 160 person banquet. Some years we have a few more, so we've grown the banquet. There again, it's the people that, you know, start coming to the banquet, more committee members come, makes things easier. And, and now we're doing, um, through our, our local chapter, we started a, a women in the outdoors chapter, my wife and some of my nieces and some other ladies that have been coming to, to some of our hunts. We started a, a local, we, uh, widow chapter, you know, so now we do, um, every year we do a dove hunt and we do a put and take pheasant hunt for the ladies. We sponsor a, a couple hundred education classes, um, each year we have a, the local wow. conservation officer, the local conservation officer. He's on our committee. Now he sits on our committee, he helps with the banquet. 
um, we do guided youth turkey hunts and, and guided youth deer hunts. And we have a veterans hunt like every other year we do a veterans hunt. And, uh, so yeah, we really got involved at the local level and we've been given back to the community, you know, and it, it's a lot of fun. We, we kind of help out. There's a, there's a state park not too far from here and they do a, a kid's triathlon, um, every year and throughout the state park. So we go over there and we man some of the booths to help give out uh, waters and you know some nwtf swag and things of that nature so yeah i mean it's uh it's busy um but it's a good busy and then as time went on and our local chapter was really doing well and you know our local chapter has got some some decent awards for some memberships things and so on and so forth and having these uh, multiple hunts and uh the regional director for the uh, turkey federation he asked me Hey, you need to come to a state board meeting and see how those you interested in coming to a meeting. And I'm like, well, sure. And I went to the state banquet and, and anyway, uh, they eventually I got uh, asked if I wanted to be on the state board. So, um, I said, yeah, I'd have some interest in that. So I kind of learned what the state board was about and got the, went to some meetings and finally put my name in the hat, went through the, the process and, um, I got voted onto the state board. And then as a state board member, I was, you know, just sitting on some committees and, and helping out and do where I could, you know, and we had some really good officers. We still have really good officers. And um, at this point, um, I noticed that we didn't have a whole lot of stuff going on about habitat. We had a lot of conservation work going on. A lot of projects were going on through, um, you know, the Superfund and, and, and Ryan was really knocking them out of the park and it's the same thing we're doing now, but I wanted to start a habitat seat program just for the state. So, um, talked to the state board members and, and we got the, um, you know, we got the green light to go ahead and do it. And we piggybacked off of Michigan's, um, supplier and they have a really good habitat seed program in Michigan. So I got to know the supplier up there in Michigan and, uh, Ryan Longenbach from wildlife seed supply, him and I become really good buddies. And, um, you know, I've been working with him since 2016 is when we started this program and, you know, we just went and, and really what the program is, is we sell discount we sell quality seed at a discounted price for NWTF members. So in order to, to, to get into this program, to be a part of this program, you, you have to be an NWTF member, you know, for $35 membership, you know, you, you get some, you get some really good deals on, on, on some stuff, you know, so it's to the point to where we're selling, you know, like Roundup Ready beans and, and Roundup Ready corn for $35 a bag. Um, you know, we've got all kinds of mixes. Ryan's put together some really good mixes, some fall mixes, some, you know, uh, spring mixes, you name it, we can have it. We have lots of clover, lots of things that at, at really good rates, discounted rates. And then I go through and I, uh, I deliver this to the members. Um, it comes to my shop. Ryan usually brings it down this year was a little different with this pandemic thing going on, but Ryan brings it down. We hang out for an evening and then I'll deliver state throughout the, or seed throughout the state. And I know in, uh, the first year I did it, in 2016, I drove 782 miles in one day and I never left the state delivering seed, you know? Wow. So that was, that was pretty cool, but I got to go around and meet all these guys. And of course, everybody wants to talk about, you know, cause their projects are the best, you know, and, and so on <laughs> and so forth. And I like to listen and I like to meet people, you know, and, and that's, that's kind of what I did. So, and then in the meantime, we started a private lands, um, um, consultation basically if, if you have a piece of property in indiana and you're really not sure what to do with it you know i'll come to your farm or if ryan boyer the, the wildlife biologist is in town or whatever and we really want to get serious about it if i can't do it over some aerial pictures on on gis and we can talk through it over the phone and, and kind of thing if you're still not for sure or you really want somebody just there to really look at it you know i'm more than happy to to come to your farm no matter where it is in the state and I'll spend a day with you or half a day or an hour or whatever it takes, you know, uh, and we'll go through and, and we'll, we'll break it down to why we're doing what we're doing and what you need to do in order to make your farm better, not just for Turkey, but for, for wildlife, um, in general. So, and so that's, that's just, that's just a few of the hats that I wear. Um, I also sit on, uh, um, the, the national president's advisory council uh, through out of South Carolina. So um, I'm into some decision-making parts up there at, at, a, at a higher level than just the state. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, uh, it keeps me really busy, and, and it's just something that I just I enjoy so much that I've, I've pretty much just poured my heart into it, you know, and, and really tried to, um, you know, just explain what the NWTF is 
to, to people and just to try to get them to understand that, you know, you really need to be a part of something, whether or not you're, you know, into to turkeys or conservation or what, but whatever conservation organization you want to belong to, you know, you need to really, to really study them and, and they're all good. You know, some are better than others. It's just like people, you know, most people are good, just some better than others, but it's, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that if you're going to belong to a, uh, you need to belong to a conservation organization, you know, whether, like I said, whether it's Rocky Mountain Elk or Ducks Unlimited or Pheasants Forever, whatever it is, you need to belong to one because we all work together to make all of this happen, you know, and your, and your membership dollars and the dollars that you spend at all the banquets, Pheasants Forever has them, Quail has them, QDMA has banquets, they all have them. That money goes back into the, the missions of those particular organizations and you know they're all important so i think uh you've literally poured your your life into this i mean you i i don't understand your your time management skills can you help me out there <laughs> i tell you what it's uh, it, it, it's uh you ask my wife i don't do a very good job of it i can tell you that so all right all but, right no, well. yeah it's uh yeah i don't i don't sleep much some days for sure no, that's, I mean, it's very admirable. Uh, what you just explained in the last couple of minutes um, was better than I could take in probably two hours and try to explain. So welcome to the podcast. You, you, you own the show now. Nice job. <laughs> All right. Well, sure. I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad you guys joined my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was awesome. And I think, uh, I think you really hit the nail on the head there. Uh, well, first of all, with, with all of it, the, the free habitat consultation, the, all the, the reasons we should be part of a branch but that last part where you said you know join at least join one you know s support these organizations especially right now right i mean the the banquets have not been being able to be held at least here in michigan um i don't know how it is down right. by you but um it definitely should support something that we're all passionate about and it's not that expensive and i think uh like you laid out enough reasons why we should right there so thanks for doing that yeah you know, another another really good reason, if I can jump right back on here for a second, yes, is please. a lot Go of people ahead. don't think about this. But, but you know, when you when you think about the political realm, you know, I know it's it's a it's a hot spot in a lot of places. But when we can say we have you know X amount of members per state, right, and we want to help the DNR pass something or or to help them back up, you know, or we we're going to do something nationally. We have two hundred and fifty thousand members that believe in this, right? That means a lot to constituents. So when you, you know, like in Indiana, we just, we, we worked with, um, you know, one of our RDs and we worked with national and we, we wrote a letter and, you know, we, uh, I signed a letter to, to send up to the, to the national resources commission because we wanted to get 410, um, shotguns to be able to hunt turkeys with and number nine shot for those, you know, TSS shot to basically, um, to hunt turkeys. And it didn't get passed last year. So what we did is we got these other, you know, we got organizations together. And we back it up with, you know, X amount of members in the state that, you know, we're behind this. We, we support the, the National Resources, you know, commissions, to, you know, to get these bills passed. So every time that something like this comes up that we want to, to help get through, you know, to help our membership, to help the hunters, you know, numbers matter to, you know, voter numbers matter. I don't care what organization you are, but the more people that you can have backing up the things that you believe in, you'll get things done. You know, and, and it's, it's the same way of fighting, you know, the, the Forest Alliance people that don't want to cut any trees and they don't want to do this and they don't want to do that. We have to do that kind of stuff in order to have healthy forest. You, you have to do it. And these people that, uh, you know, that are, that are uh, totally against cutting down, you know, what they call old growth forest or what have you, you know, that those are beautiful to look at, but they don't do a lot of good for the wildlife. they just, they really don't. And, and, but the people that are so adamant about pushing for that and not, I mean, there's, they're a small group with a great big voice. So the more people that we can have on board to, to help fight for the scientific based, uh, you know, the research and, and, you know, everything that we do, we, we, it matters. You know, every, every membership matters, you know, so that's another reason, you know, if nothing else, just to, so there's one more person on that, you know, if it's 250,000 and one, it makes a difference, you know, so. That's another reason. That's a, that's a great reason. I think um, that's how the world works, whether we like it or not. And when you can swing around numbers like that, uh, I mean, hey, it talks. Um, and it, what's your membership cost right now annually? 
It's it's thirty five dollars to be a member uh, for a year, and if you get online and you sign up online, you get a twenty five dollar Bass Pro Shop card. Thanks to Johnny Morris and everybody, wonderful people at Bass Pro Shop, they chuck those in for twenty five bucks. So actually, you you get to be a member for ten bucks a year, you know, and you get to you get to spend twenty five bucks on some. Yeah, to me that's a yeah that's pretty much a no brainer for ten dollars, you know, when it comes down to it. So very nice. Very and then nice. there's other you know there's yep and then like I kind of alluded to at the first you know there's there's memberships all the way up to sponsor memberships you know all the way up to the to the million dollar club kind of a deal you know to where there's there's higher you know there's, there's diamond life members and silver life members and you know and, and you name it it's there so whatever you can you can afford and if wherever your passion lays you know and then it's pretty cool with the with the higher level giving things it's like if you've been a member for say 20 years and you've been a, a normal member or you've been a sponsor membership at your banquets all that money accumulates onto your lifetime giving and then say you want to be a a, a diamond life member at a ten thousand dollar level and you've and over the years the the membership dollars that you put in you're up to eight thousand dollars just say that over the last 20 25 years you know, you've only got to come up with a couple thousand and you can pay that over a period of time if that's so you choose to do so. But then you become a, a Diamond Life member, you know, and that money goes to, to more things, you know, and you can re- at a $10,000 level, you can restrict your, your money to whether you want it to stay in your state or if you want it to let it run out into the whole United States. You know, I'm an upper level wow. giver guy and I didn't restrict my money because I hunt other states, right? If now I want to go to Arkansas and hunt, you know, or I, I go to Missouri and I go to Iowa, wherever I go, Kentucky, wherever. So I did not restrict my dollars to the state of Indiana because in my mind, I spend, I, I, I enjoy the other states. So I would like for the NWTF to use my money where my money needs to be used. It may be in Florida. It may be in Arizona. It may be in Indiana, but I want them to use the money. I want them to use their, their individuals that know where the money needs to be spent to be able to spend it you know, and not restrict it just to Indiana. And that, that was just, that's just my personal preference, you know, and, you, you know, if, if, if somebody wanted to do that in Michigan and just keep it in Michigan, uh, that's great too, because we still need dollars in Michigan. So, but that's, that's how I decided my wife and I decided that's how we do our part. Well, it's, it seems pretty cool that you guys, I mean, you guys seem flexible, right? You'll, you'll do it or you'll at least make it seem how if I join if I wanted to donate a bunch of money or a little bit of money, I could do it how I wanted. And that, that seems to be um, an advantage to a lot of people, or maybe that's what they want to do. So I know when through my paycheck at work, I donate a little bit to United Way every, every two weeks. And we can pick whether it's United Way of Michigan or, or wherever else, or you can pick your own charity. So I think um, that's a good idea and it probably helps grab more people and, and get them on board. So at least you guys are, thinking about that stuff and being flexible and making things happen. So nice work. Now I yep, wanted to roll. You. Yeah. It's... Oh no. Yeah. You bet. No, I, no I go ahead. To... Nope. Go oh, ahead. I wanted to roll into the, the bread and butter of uh, what we like to talk about and that's Turkey habitat. So I want to know what your definition of Pat is, is Turkey habitat. What is Turkey habitat to you? Well, I tell you what, that's a, that, that may be the hardest question I'll ever answer because turkey habitat is not just one habitat. You know, turkey habitat, you know, it's, I guess it, it's kind of like every other, um, I don't want to get long-winded here for a second, but oh, it's, like every other, it, it's like every other animal that there is. got to have food, water, and shelter, right? That's, that's the main habitat that every animal has to have, whether it's a turkey, white-tailed deer, quail, whatever it is. And if they don't have the right habitat to sustain what they need, then they're not going to stay where you want them. So to answer your question, what is turkey habitat or what is my definition of turkey habitat? It is all habitat because they need everything from open fields to soft edges along those fields to briar bushes in the start of the woods or or brush piles for nesting, things of that nature. They need the big trees for roosting. They need like every other, every other animal, they need water, you know, whether it's a creek, a stream, pond, whatever it is, they got to have, they got to have those things in order to survive, you know? So turkey habitat, when you restore, or I hate to use the word restore, but if you, if you conserve habitat and you make 
the right habitat for turkeys. You also may habitat for pretty much every other animal in your area, from the grasshoppers to the squirrels to the deer to whatever you have roaming around there, rabbits or whatever. That is one great thing about turkey habitat. When we put together a plan for turkey habitat, it benefits everything that lives outside, basically. From, like I said, mutter- butterflies to, to mice to you name it, 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 it creates habitat for everything. So I guess for to answer your question, it's diversified. Turkey habitat is diversified. And without diversified habitat, you won't have turkeys on your place. They may travel through your place. They may know that there's some big oak trees in there that they may roost on your place, but they may not, uh, you know, they may not make a living at your place every day, day in and day out. They may travel through because it's not the right habitat, you know. So that that's that's a t- that's a tough thing, you know, to uh, to answer in that, you know, because it's so many sure. things. Turkey habitat is so many things. Sure, and and we have a couple things we're going to dive into here. Um, but you, you mentioned something there that I'm kind of curious about. You refrained from using the word restore. Is there a reason for that? Well, you know, if you restore something to its natural state, right? I mean, in order to restore it to the actual, if you think of an old car, right? Say you're going to restore a 57 Chevy and you want to do it period correct, right? And you go in there and every square head bolt that needs to be a square headed bolt to square headed bolt and everything, you know, to the, to the, exact tires that they put onto the factory, right? That's a pretty tough nut to crack Mm -hmm. to get it absolutely period correct. It's the same thing with, with the woods, unless you, you know, if if we say we're going to restore it to its, to its natural state or to its original natural state, you know, we can't plant 300 year old trees, right? We can't do this. We can't do that. Now you can make it to the point to where you can um, get it back to almost restored you know to the point that it is so close but it's not it's not perfect you know because we don't have the old some of the old growth and we don't have because if you if you think about it when way back when when the um you know if you want to go back as far as indians or back farther than that you know we had natural fires that would come through and burn all this a lot of this stuff off and help start new growth and so on and so forth we don't have that anymore we just we just don't have the opportunity to um, restore something to its to its perfect natural state. We have too many invasive species. We have too many aphids and things that aren't aren't native to the to the ground. We you know we have so many things that um, that have been inter- introduced. You know, and some things were introduced by um, organizations just like ourselves that we you know everybody thought it was a good idea and now it's not. You know that kind of thing. So in order to, to restore it, you would have to basically have a clean slate to start. And we don't have that opportunity to have that, you know, so that, I guess that would be the main reason that I, I kind of back off from the restore section of, of habitat. No, I'm, I'm glad you, uh, you expounded on that. I think um, a lot of us use that term and, and well, well, maybe another term could be, could be more beneficial, but th- thanks for explaining that. I think, uh, you, you did mention turkey habitat is not just one type of habitat. It's very diverse. And, and we kind of talked about this before. There's, there's four or five different types of turkey habitat. And I don't know about you, but when I'm hunting them, they're hard to, they're hard to keep within you know, 10, 20 acres. They're, they're moving from different types of habitat around. Um, what are those types and, and how can we help you know, improve those? Yeah. You know, the, the main thing, you know, of general wildlife or wild turkey habitat, you know, of course, they need trees and those trees provide the food, you know, think acorns and stuff. They have, you know, um, they can rest under the big trees. You know, they can escape under that cover. And most importantly is their nighttime roost sites. You know, and that's you think about big trees and grasses. You can, you know, they provide uh, food for the adults, you know, because they're, they're full of bugs and, and also, but they they're important to poults also. But you think about the grasses, you know, and a lot of people think about, you see a pasture, right? And that's fescue and so on and so forth. That grass is thick. It's like hair on a dog, you know, it's just so thick. So in order to understand what, what kind of grasses that you need for turkey habitat or even for, you know, uh, quail habitat, it's kind of the same. If you were to lay down on your belly and, and, and look straight ahead when you're laying in this grass and you could maneuver through that grass, 
you know, without touching another blade of grass, you know, if you were a turkey poult or a, or a quail or, or a pheasant or what have you, you know, that's the kind of habitat you need. And then when you turn over and lay on your back, is there some cover over the top of you to, to protect you from the hawks and, you know, some of the, the predators that are in the air that are looking for you, you know? And then also, is it is it also have, you know, some forbs in there that you can eat, plus it holds bugs, you know? So it's not just about grass. You know, it's got to be the right kind of grass, the cool and warm season grasses that, you know, that we need that, that protect those particular, you know, those poults and, you know, and so they can forage for insects and so on and so forth. And then you also need, you know, moisture, you know, it's, it's a direct and indirect, I guess, key feature of any survival in wild turkey and the reproduction part of it, you know, no moisture, nothing lives, you know. So if, if you don't have any moisture for the plants to grow or the turkeys to drink and so on and so forth, you know, that's uh, that, that's a detrimental to, to anything. And that may be another reason that, you know, uh, turkeys don't stay on your, you know, you say your little 10-acre spot. You know, a turkey's range is about a six-mile range when you get down to it. Wow. You know, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, now there'll be some that residents, you know, that especially nesting season. But if you see turkeys, you know, one day they may be, you know, two or three miles down. If something draws them to there or their, or their food sources ran thin, you know, they're going to move. I mean, they're, they're nomads. You know, if you, if you watch turkeys go across the field, you know, you just watch them. They remind me of nomads. They just keep walking until it's time to go to bed, you know, and, and that's one thing that especially Eastern turkeys that, um, and then there's some, there are some farms, don't get me wrong, that, that birds roost in the same trees and they have for years. Right. But also an Eastern turkey, the you know, ones what, that we're all fortunate enough to have, uh, you know, some, they won't, sometimes they don't roost in the same tree. They'll have several different roosting spots. So, you know, especially when it's not, you know, hunting season, when the, when the uh, hens aren't nesting and they're kind of in the same area and it keeps those toms, you know, drawn. But so, you know, they, they, the turkey will walk a mile a day, you just hunting bugs, you know, so there again, that's a little bit, a little bit tough to, to, to pin down sometimes, you know, on that. Okay. But then you got, no. you know, your nesting, you then, yep. Then you got, you know, like your nesting habitat, you know, when you, when you get down, when it, we break it down a little bit more, you know, nesting habitat, you need lateral cover. You know, they got to be uh, with a well-developed understory, you know, full of vegetation, like I said, brush piles, briar patches, you know, blackberry patch or whatever, you know, and even those, those, those grasses that, um, you know, that go, that's why I try to tell, I try to tell everybody, you know, don't, other than a hay field, if you're mowing hay, cause you're getting it for your livestock, you got to mow hay when you have to mow hay, you know, and there's a lot of little fawns that get run through a mower conditioner every year because they're bedded down out in there, you know, and I'm sure there's lots of turkey nests that get ran over too, but don't mow, you know, until at least the first of June, you know, give those, give those nesting sites a chance, you know, and, and, you know, if, if I know it makes the places look better and, and, and things look better when you get things all mowed up, but if you can leave that for the cover for the poults and, and, you know, even after the June, you know, let that seed go to head so the turkeys have something else to eat. It's just more cover. So, you know, I, I try to tell people for that. But the overhead cover, you know, with a canopy, it's kind of a layer of camouflage for the turkeys. You know, the it layer again, like we kind of touched on it, it's, it keeps the avian predators out of it. You know, the it's, it's tough not to... Uh, you know, blame the coons and the possums and skunks and everything else for, the, you know, they eat a lot of turkey nests too, you know, so we could, we could have a whole nother program on, on what predators to trap to, to help turkey populations, you know, coyotes yep. and everything else that, that come in live. But the coons are probably one of the hardest things on, on, on turkey, you know, so, and then, you know, once the, once the turkeys hatch out, you know, the, the, the basically the brood that's the running around there, you know, they need, uh, definitely need an insect rich environment you know with with efficient um, foraging for for you know you think of a an old hen that has eight or ten poults or six poults or four poults or whatever it is you know they need a lot of bugs you know that's their main thing and um they they just have to have that habitat that permits frequent foraging throughout the day enough of it to hold you know if they don't have enough there to hold it they're going to move someplace that that does you know and then they need enough cover to hide kind of like we talked before but it also allows enough um unobstructed vision for the adult to, you know, basically stick her head up and look, but get back down under there, you know, cause the poults are down there. They don't know. They're not looking for hawks and everything else, you know, what's going on. So unless the old, the old hen starts putting and then everybody knows what's going on, you know, they just lay down and they get really still, you know, so, but 
you know, there again, like we, it all comes right back down to food, you know, or, you know, water and, and, and cover. But, and then also along, um, say your food plots, if you put in a food plot, you know, you need to really think about putting some clover in. I tell everybody, no matter what, whether it's deer or turkey, whatever it is, always think about planting yourself from clover because clover has the, the most tonnage, the most protein, holds the most bugs for everything. You know, wheat and oats do the same thing. Um, so that's very important. And then you should, along those food plots, if you have some lanes, you know, to your, to your um, clover plots or what have you, you can mow some of those lanes in there and it lets the poults get through a clover field, you know, like my clover, you know, it'll be 25 inches tall and you can't walk through it before I mow it, you know, and I get it mowed down, but I also mow some paths around it that uh, maybe with a, you know, even if you take a weed eater, you know, or whatever to, to let these poults go through there. Cause there's so many bugs and they'll sneak in and out and they'll do their thing. And then you might want to run a disc strip along the field edges to provide dusting areas because the main reason that, you know, turkeys dust is for the, is for mites. You know they have the they have mites that get in them, so they they get in there and they rub in that and that dirt and that helps keep the mites off of them. You know, so dusting areas are so important. You know, you can if you got a six foot disc or a four foot disc on your tractor and you can uh, just long one edge and and disc it just to keep the weeds down and spray it whatever just to make sure the dirt's loose so they can get in there and and uh, and really start dusting. So if you do that and you have turkeys on your property, it won't be long and they'll they'll really be in there making it happen you know so and then one thing too to really to help out your um, vegetation and your unwanted vegetation and so on and so forth is controlled burns you know if you have some warm season grass you're lucky enough to have some um, you know crp or you know or if it's not crp if you can't burn your crp if it's not in the program but if you have your own fields that you can burn or the woods you know, it's a it's the best thing. The cool season fires is a is an excellent tool for managing unwanted vegetation. You know, and it naturally naturally re- regenerates the areas. You know, if you've ever seen where uh, somebody's throwing a cigarette out in the road ditch and it's burned a big part of the road ditch, and what happens? That grass comes back thicker and greener than ever. You know, so that's kind of the same thing. It enhances the soil. It releases the natural seed bank. It encourages the growth of those forbs and those 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 grasses and you know, even in certain pine forests, you know, those, some of those pine seeds or those pine cones, they, the seeds, they won't, they won't grow until they go through a burn, you know, so it's, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy that, um, you know, to, to help make these natural openings with fire and watch what happens after fire and the, the, after the prescribed burns on how much food the turkeys come back in there and they're, it's just open and it creates those, you know, areas to really, to help hold them, you know. And then, you know, there again, there's your, your edge management. We talked about some soft edges on some fields, you know, that being, you know, just the, the cover, whether it's a, a clover or it's your warm, cool season grasses, whatever you can put along that edge. Most farmers, you know, there's a couple of places that we hunt uh, that we don't own, but we still have permission to hunt there. And, and you think about you're walking the cornfield or the beans and, you know, 20 foot out, 30 foot out, 50 foot out whatever from the edge of the field the tree roots have sapped that all down the, the coons and the squirrels have pretty much broke every piece of corn off they you know they've they've pulled the stalks down and people blame it all on deer but i think the coon and squirrels are just as hard on corn as as deer are but you know there again if if you can go in there maybe you can talk that farmer into not farming that you know three or four rows of, of corn you know 10 12 foot of corn you know because it doesn't bring him any money anyway when it's all comes said and done and the tree limbs are hanging over and he's it's getting into his planter and combine everything else. Maybe you can talk him into letting you, you know, put a little soft edge on, on, on part of your farm that you, that you get to hunt. So, you know, but you also talking about mowing and you're talking about grasses and clover. You also need to have no mow zones, no mow, no mow areas along the edges to allow this grass to, to get big and give these birds a place to hide. You know, yeah, it doesn't look the best, but it, it holds so many bugs and crickets and grasshoppers and you name it. It's in that tall grass, you know, chiggers and everything else that they eat. So it's, uh, it's pretty important that you, um, that you have some of that edge management for sure. And then if you want to manipulate your food plots there again, you can, you can do your, like we kind of just talked with your, um, you know, season seed mixes. You, you can go into the, you know, cornfields, of course, you know, they attract deer in the fall and the winter and they're, but they're also an excellent food source for turkeys. If, you know, we have a guy that farms a farm of ours and we have him leave corn 
we'll have, we'll pay for, you know, 12 rows of corn, you know, ever how long we want to pay for it. And he said, well, the field's making X amount of bushels per acre and that four rows of corn so far along, that's, you know, a hundred bushel of corn and it's X amount of dollars or whatever. And then we'll go in there and, you know, we'll leave it up for the deer. Um, in the winter, it's not only cover, but it, it, it gives them a food source. And then, um, in the winter time, if there's anything left, a lot of times they eat it all. You know, we'll go in there and, and, and you know, knock it down, just drive through it, get it down on the ground, let the turkeys eat the remainder of it, you know, for the winter time, just to get them, help them get them through the winter. But you can do that. Um, you know, you need to have your mixes um, with your annual clovers, of course, your brassicas, your turnips, your rape, you know, um, things of that nature, your oats and wheat, you know, all that throughout late spring in the summer. That just, it just, it just, everything helps. You know, especially if you do, if you do wheat, we plant a lot of wheat. I'm fortunate enough that I have an uncle that has a wheat research farm. So we get a lot of wheat that's never going to make it to market. And we plant a lot of wheat in the fall and then we'll mow it in the summertime, you know, and scatter all that grain once it becomes, um, you know, wheat and the turkeys eat it and the birds eat it. Every finch is, everything eats it. And then we'll go in there and we'll, you know, we'll round up it, you know, right before we do our fall plots, you know, so there again, it's, it's just something you just kind of got to think ahead of what you want to do, you know, and, uh, that's, that's how we kind of do it. You know, then they make chufa for, for turkeys and, and chufa is, is good. It's like growing corn. Um, we've grown a little bit of it. We have trouble keeping weeds out of it. And I think if I was to do it again, I'd probably plant it in rows, um, such as I would corn instead of, we kind of broadcasted it the few times that we tried it, but I'll get it to the point where if I plant it in rows, I'll be able maybe to cultivate it before it gets, you know, too many weeds in it or what have you. So, and then, you know, we're getting back into the woods area, your, your hard and soft mass trees, you know, your, your oak trees. And I mean, everything that, that comes with the hard mass, but then your soft mass is your blackberries, your wild raspberries, your wild grapes. All those are important to wild turkeys. You know, they, and, and if they're not producing as much as you think, you know, you can fertilize those areas. You can go in there with some triple 19 or some triple 13 or whatever, and just take a broadcaster and and broadcast them on that and help them out a little bit, you know, kind of give them a little bit of, give them a little bit of, of a boost to help them go. And then if you don't have trees on your place and you're trying to, to do that, I mean, each and every year I would suggest that you, um, you know, plant groupings of hard and soft mass trees uh, and shrubs on your property, you know, plant some this year, plant some next year. So they're all growing in, in different things, you know, plant just some oak trees. And I did that here on the place that I live and, these trees now are probably 15 years old, some of them, and, you know, they've been producing acorns for the last couple of years, and, I mean, they're loaded. You know, they're right here close to the yard. I've got persimmon trees planted. We've got apples and pears, and so you need, you know, there's mulberry trees and crab apple trees and everything else that you can plant as your soft mass trees in between your hard mass, and it, it, it all makes a difference. It helps. There again, like we talked, all of that stuff that we've been talking about doesn't just benefit the turkey. It benefits everything. You know, the deer are oh, going to be in sure. there eating your apples and your pear. You know, everybody's there eating. They're all making a living on it, you know. So, you know, then and, and, you know, we've talked about the water having all that. And then, so, you know, that's kind of my my whole take on, on, on that. You know, when you start seeing turkeys on your place, you know, that makes your heart pitter-patter. It does mine anyway, you know, and you start oh, seeing yeah. some toms roosting there, you know. And, and we're fortunate or unfortunate, however you want to say it, but when we're deer hunting, we usually have nine or 10 long beards on our farm. They're there all fall. We get to see them walk through. They're all roost. You get to watch them fly up on the roost and we get to hear them, you know, talking and doing what they do. And then come springtime, they all leave, <laughs> you know, they all, they all disperse and they go their way. We might keep one Turkey on our place, you know, or in that we can hear them, but they're, you know, they're, they're, they're with their hens and so on and so forth. But yeah. So, you know, we, we fight that battle too, even with some of the stuff that we got going on. Um, we've got a, We've got a big plan um, to do some stuff with about 12 acres. We've laid it all out, and we're we're gonna we're gonna change things up uh, next year. We've kind of got things laid out on what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it. And uh, so I, there's gonna be some really good things to come on our little piece of piece of the pie. Some of the things that uh, we can work through. And um, I'm gonna get um, our wildlife biologist Ryan. I'm gonna get him back down here, and and uh, we're gonna we're gonna really make it happen. You know, we're just going to, we're going to do the best we can with what we've got. So. Yeah, for sure. So Pat, uh, what's the uh, way we can incorporate those habitat changes into a hunting strategy? If, if we have like a blank slate, maybe start there where we can 
turn an old field into some turkey habitat. How would we go about setting that well, up to help us have a better hunting situation? Well, the first thing you need to do is is, is you're going to have to get rid of the it's, – it's an old – say it's an old pasture. You're going to have to get rid of some fescue, that, the real tight grasses that are growing. And, and it usually takes two or three um, spray-ins of Roundup or glyphosate to, to get rid of that. You know, to, you kind of got to work on it. You want to plant your – your uh, warm season grasses and stuff in the, in the in the fall anyway. It helps the winter time helps them germinate. They'll come up with your wildflowers and everything else. And you know, and, and there again, you can work through a guy like Ryan at Wildlife Seed Supply, and, and he'll help generate you a mix that will work the best for you. And then if you don't, you know, if you don't, uh, if you've got some trees on your place, and you know, you don't have, um, you know, a lot of mass trees, hard mass trees. And then, you know, chestnuts and nobody's got chestnuts anymore, but you can plant some chestnuts. You can plant some oak trees. You know, it's going to be a, a game of patience in order to make that to make that happen. Um, but the, the short order that you can do in order to help turkeys either come to your place or stay on your place is a is an optimal place for them to eat. Right. And but they they have to have an optimal place to eat. They like clover or some wheat or whatever you decide you want to plant uh, there again. Go with the clover. As long as there is some, if you planted a, say you had a 10 acre field and you could do a, 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 a couple acre clover patch in the middle of that field. And then you could put some corn around that clover patch, you know, or broadcast some soybeans around it. And then on the outside of that, you could put some, some grasses, you know, or make some strips. So, so those turkeys can go through from one to the other, just like deer, deer will use it just like turkeys do. And if you don't have a lot of trees on that place and you don't really feel like planting some trees, or you can plant some trees, but you don't want to wait 15 years for an oak tree to make um, acorns. You can drive you a couple fence posts in that um, in that grass, that warm season grass as you got, and stretch yourself a wire across there, and watch what happens. It won't be long; there'll be mulberry trees coming up in there because every bird in the county is going to land on that, and they're going to plant trees for you. You know, it's the same thing with every other tree in the and, and your multiplier rows, the berries they eat off of it, and everything. So before too long, within a few That's years awesome. period of time, there'll be there'll be shrubs and There'll be, you know, uh, anything that's got a seed that a bird eats, they're going to plant that for you down through there. And it's uh, it's pretty amazing how fast those actually grow. You know, you think of a mulberry tree, it doesn't take long. Mulberry trees, pretty tall, pretty quick, you know. And uh, so yeah, those things start to happen, you know. That's a great tip. So, I've, you, I've thought about that before, watching birds sit in different places, but I've never heard anybody put it in those terms. That's That's fantastic. Thank you for that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Just make sure you put it up high enough that you don't catch yourself on a snowmobile or whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, right. or a four wheeler. Yeah. Make sure you get it up or at least flag it. And we'll be safety first. Right. I mean, you, you can do that with uh, tree tops or, or felled trees as well. Right. Like if you, if you drop oh, a couple of trees down, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of times that we'll cut trees. You know, we got, of course, we're like every place else in the country. We've got a lot of ash trees going down, you know, but then we have a lot of, uh, uh, thorn what we call thorn trees locust trees you know with the big thorns on them so we've been ringing those and but instead of burning all the brush we we make uh we, we'll put brush piles in you know not tight you know i don't take the skid steer with the with the grapple bucket on it and pack it so tight that you can't you know animals can't use it but the more of those you can put in strategic spots the more the more that you can um you know you'll hold turkeys and nests especially if they've got that cover beside it and there's some food there you know just and even if the turkeys don't nest in it you know, the rabbits are using it, the, the songbirds are, everything's going to use those brush piles, you know, for, for cover and everything else. And then, you know, and if you have some, um, some logs that you want to put in, say, I, I, I talked about this on my, when I do wildlife or when I do whitetail habitat seminars, you can take a log about four or five foot long. And I like to use, you know, something that doesn't rot real quick, but I don't know, say eight, 10, 12 inches in diameter, four or five foot long. And place those, lay them flat along your along your food plots, back in the woods or back along the edge of a tall in the grass or whatever. And those create deer beds. Those are especially lazy to the point that they'll lay down as close to their um, food source as possible. And if you put oh, that yeah. log in there, four or five logs, they'll start using that. You go in there and you know, and, and if it's a rocky area, get rid of the rocks, sticks, and stuff. And I, I almost guarantee you, within a week or two weeks, they'll be deer bedded all along those logs. So you can create simple habitat. Doesn't take much. Chainsaw, cut a couple trees down if you don't need the wood. You know, pick out maybe some soft maple tree that's not doing you any good, right? Pile that up. I know that those logs won't last forever. 
plan there, but get those going to where the where the habitat, you know, there again, it's all about the habitat for all the animals, and start strategically placing those, you know, three here, one here, two there, whatever, and spread them out a little bit, and, and the deer will start using those. So there's another thing, a strategy that you can use, you know, to to help your property along, I guess. You know, there's simple things that you can do that doesn't that they don't take any any equipment at all. You know, per se. Yeah, that's a good tip. Anytime you can do something that doesn't cost a lot and you can get it done quickly, that makes a difference for sure. So, Pat, Absolutely. give us a couple of uh, past examples where you've been successful with some of these strategies we've just been talking about. Yeah, you know, I uh, there again on that 75 acres that we bought down there. You know, we really we brought that along just because it's our own, but. You know, when, and here at my house, I had a, I had a six acre, um, hay field at the house here and I built a new shop and I had to build up the back of the barn about four and a half foot because of the way the ground fell off. And I always had a wet spot, spring fed wet spot in the, in the, in the, my place. So what I did, I laid out a kind of a vision. So I ended up digging a pond so I could get the dirt. I didn't want to have to buy dirt, stuck a pond. Now my pond, of course it's holding water and I planted all these trees and in between these rows of trees, that I planted, I put, I've got clover and and I plant sunflowers and I plant all kinds of different stuff for the, for the animals to use. So on my own place, I kind of follow my own, my own suggestions. And then I also had a a gentleman that um, I went down to his place, kind of like you said, I, here's a clean slate. What do we got to do with it? You know, so we laid out a, um, um, just a, a roadmap on what we needed to do. And he said, man, I don't have the equipment to do this. You know, I really don't have you know, this and that. So we kind of got to the point to where, as you know, I can take some equipment down there and I can help him out. Or he's like, you know, and he did a lot of that with his garden rototiller. He went in there with his tiller and he tilled a bunch of strips up that we talked about. He kind of funnels deer in. We work to where we can funnel the deer, funnel the turkeys, you know, and and whatever you need to do, whatever your goal is. His goal was more about um, deer hunting than it was than, than turkeys, but he has turkeys there and turkeys use the same there again. They use the same habitat that we've created for the deer, you know, and, and he was, he was definitely not um, a farmer or have any kind of agriculture background, and which is fine. You know, a lot of this stuff isn't as hard as you think it is. Once you get your pH tested and you, and you, you know, start, you can broadcast with a, with a crank spreader. You don't have to have fancy equipment and drills and planters and tractors. You can do a lot, you know, with just sweat labor. But so that's, that's one of the very good things. He started out, he's an NWTF member. He's a, um, a very good committee member in his area. He called me up. We went down there. I did a little seminar for him and about six of his buddies. Kind of went through a whole spiel of of what they needed to do from start to finish. We went, all of us went and toured his farm. We actually went to another farm and we laid out and I have a a dry erase board that I take with me and we start drawing on there and what we need to do, you know, and they're taking pictures with their phones and when my phone's always available, they call me. So those are a lot of the successes that you know, and there's, and I could go on and on about different people that we've helped, you know, not just me, but Ryan and other people on the committees and the state board and everybody else that's helped along the way. But it's, uh, it's pretty satisfying for me. I'm kind of to that point in my life where I like to see others succeed, you know, and taking a kid hunting or somebody that's never been hunting or never killed a turkey or, you know, first time deer hunters that, that, that warms my heart more so than, than me filling my tag anymore, you know, not that I don't like to, but, you know, and seeing somebody's uh, farm or somebody's dream farm that 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 came along you know and having the knowledge to to help them along the way is uh, something that really warms my heart you know yeah for sure yeah you mentioned getting around some different states have you gotten your slam in i have not i'm missing my florida bird it's the only one i'm missing and um i'm, I'm working on that i, I don't want to most of my other birds that i've hunted i've got a buddy that i hunt with all the time and we've we've killed most of them on public land our other ones, of course, not our Easterns, but our, our Rio and our Miriam, we got on public land. So that that's a pretty neat thing. But Florida seems to be pretty heavy in, in hunters on public land. I've heard some nightmares about that. So I'm working on a, I'm working on a spot down Florida. So I'm hoping that's going to pan out one of these years and, and, uh, and get that done. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that, that's what's nice when you get to experience enough for yourself. And like you said, it's just uh, real fulfilling to start giving back to other people and, and passing on all the information that you've picked up over the years and helping somebody yeah, else get it's started. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. You know, this even something as simple as having our uh, put-and-take pheasant hunt for the women. You know, we had some women come, oh, I don't know how many years ago it's been, and they just love the dogs. They love watching the dogs work and so on and so forth. 
And some of those women that came to our first hunt, they were so intrigued with those dogs that they end up getting dogs and they trained dogs. They worked with trainer or whoever, you know, they'd never had a hunting dog in their life. They loved it so much. And now I have them coming back and they mentor the new ladies every year with their own dog. You know, now that that's wow. pretty cool. You know, I've seen that, I've seen that come full circle, you know, and that's, that's just, that almost makes me have goosebumps, you know, when I talk about it. So it's pretty cool. That's great know, to see that happen. Yeah. So that's some of the some of the little successes that you know you see along the way. The, the list is pretty long, you know, and and that's one thing that 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 you'll see about uh, this organization, the NWTF, that you know we 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 do not do a very good job of uh, tooting our own horn to say, you know, we're <laughs> we're all pretty well, you know, and that's and that's a that's a hard thing to get somebody to do, you know. We just we go yeah, along, okay. we do our job, and you know, yeah, and we do what we're supposed to do, and we don't brag a lot and. You know, we just just keep plugging along. You know, so. Well, those those are the kind of people that we like to talk to and we like to work with. We're we're both the same kind of kind of people uh, internally. So, we do appreciate you you coming on and, and telling your story and all about the NWTF. Um, I'd like to wrap this up with you know maybe just t- tell us about what you're doing these days and how we can find you um, if we wanted to reach out. Sure. Yep. Yeah, you can find me at uh, I'm a um, I'm. A, real estate agent. I'm a land specialist for Base Camp Country Real Estate. And you can get me at patrick.mcfadden at basecampcountry.com or you can get me at mcfadden.nwtf at gmail.com. Either one of them I've got going. So, you know, with the with Base Camp being, you know, the outdoor um, real estate agent or real estate company that it is, you know, it's a, it's, it's an awesome company to work for. I, I really enjoy working for it. And I love using my knowledge of, of my habitat and things when I take people out to look at properties and, and we, we get to talking about nuts and bolts of the property and what the, my vision would be if I owned it, you know, and, and try to help them with some ideas and, you know, and, and it's pretty, it's pretty neat. I get to, I get to meet some really nice people and I get to make some pretty good friends out of, of just knowing what I know and helping people, find their dream you know they're, they're, it's just so cool to be a real estate agent for base camp country and and to get to, to get to know these people and and find their slice of heaven you know uh, of what goes on so it, it's just it's just awesome i mean we, we have a great company that the, the office staff is is second to none all our agents are great you know we've got agents in indiana illinois um ohio kentucky kansas so you know we, it's in wisconsin michigan so yeah, it's uh, it's 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 quite the deal, and so I'm pretty busy with that. Uh, you know, too. That's kind of my um, the something that I want to do full time when I retire. Um, I'm so I got just a couple more years to work for the man, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna go out and uh, and get this, you know, get the uh, and enjoy being out and and walking the walking properties with people, and and even more than I do now, when I don't have to just do it every evening and on the weekends, you know, I can maybe one of these days I can get it to the point where I can do it on a Monday at one o'clock, you know, so that'd be a lot of fun. So that's kind of what I'm doing. I, we got, uh, we have to get through this pandemic where we can start having our, our, our banquets again and, and start raising some more money. That'll, that'll be great. You know, so I, I would imagine once those start, I'm going to be making a lot of trips around thanking people for coming, you know, as the state chapter president, I'm going to try to hit all the banquets that I can and, and just, uh, show my kudos. So, that's pretty much what I got going on. I got some fall plots I need to get to get finished up or get ready to start and uh, get that shop built down there at the farm for my new cabin. Other than that, I'm I'm not doing much. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Well, I, I wanted to thank you for coming on tonight. This is a great great episode. I know uh, you and the guys at Base Camp have, have been nothing but but awesome. I know Nathan and and Tom and and yourself and I actually. Uh, Ben Plattner just showing you guys. I know Ben from a few years back. He's a friend of mine. So I know you guys are, you know, a good group of guys with, you know, the right things on the horizon and uh, look forward to growing with you. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate you having us on, man. This is awesome. It's, it's, it's there again, it's refreshing to meet new people and, and talk to people that have the same outlook on life as we do. And it's the, uh, I really appreciate everything that you guys do. I and mean, it's, it's, you guys have a great podcast and I enjoy listening to it. A lot of great information on here. Hey, we try, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's what we're passionate about. That's for sure. Well, Hey Patrick, thank you very much. Uh, we'll keep in touch. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you guys need anything or, uh, you let me know, I'm, I'm here to help. Thanks Pat. Uh, Appreciate your awesome. time.
Thank you, Pat. Thank you. You guys have a great evening. You too. You too. Thank you so much, Pat, for hopping on the podcast with us tonight. What a great episode that was. And I learned a ton about Turkey Habitat, the NWTF, and all that goes with it. So thank you very much, sir. Hope you have a great rest of 2020. We'll keep in touch. Now, everybody else, uh, thanks for coming in once again to listen to the show. We can't do it without you guys. Thanks for the great reviews, the shares on Facebook, the subscribes and subscriptions on YouTube. Really appreciate it, guys. I want to thank you guys. And I also want to thank our sponsors. We have Packer Max Cult of Packers. The Hunt Wise app, Killer Food Plots, 5 2 Outdoors, Michigan Whitetail Pursuit, The Habitat Hook, and Stony Creek Realty. Thank you guys for your support in the show. We will be back again soon. Please follow us along on our social media accounts to see what we're doing day to day. We'll have another episode for you next week as we become better habitat managers. <laughs>